Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Hewitt. Thank you for the generous introduction. A particular thank you to our host, the Greater Cleveland Partnership. I very much appreciate your hospitality today. I'd also like to welcome and say hello to my good friend, Joe Stanislav, who is the co-author of The Commanding Heights and co-founder of Cambridge Energy Research Associates, or SARA. Many a CEO and government official around the world has benefited from Joe's insight on economic issues. He's a great champion of Ohio around the world. He's from Warren, and I'm very pleased to see him here today. And I'd like to thank all of you for turning out so early this morning. I'm grateful. I'm not surprised. I somehow guessed that people from Cleveland would be up early, a city well known for its energy and dynamism and very strong Midwestern values. I think Cleveland has faced challenging times, along with the rest of the country in recent years. But I think thanks to that extraordinary work ethic and resilience, it has always come through. And it's not called the comeback city for nothing. These are qualities we at BP, we prize them. And we've had our challenges too, you'll know about them. But we're working our way back, just like this great city. Of course, Cleveland is not only famous for its human energy, but its role as a city gave birth to the modern energy industry. A story many of you may not know, but on a February day in 1865, Cleveland was the scene of a very curious business meeting between two partners in an oil refinery, Maurice Clark and John D. Rockefeller. Clark was cautious and conservative, and Rockefeller was the adventurous one. And they couldn't agree on what to do with the company. So they decided to hold an auction there and then for control of the business. And the bidding started at $500, and it climbed up to $72,000, and Clark said he couldn't go any higher, and Rockefeller calmly bid $72,500, and the business was his. And that led, in a few short years, to the incorporation of the great Standard Oil Company, a company that later gave birth to Standard Oil of Ohio, which BP is proud to count as one of its heritage businesses. Ohio still has an important place in America's energy landscape, and in BP's as well. So we have nearly 1,200 employees and contractors working at a refinery in Toledo, and we operate that in partnership with Husky Energy. We're a leading marketer of BP-branded fuels in Ohio, where we have more than 600 service stations. And AirBP is the leading provider of aviation fuel at the Cleveland Airport where we fuel about 70% of all the planes that take off every day. We play our part in the life of the community, and last year contributed about $600,000 in grants and donations to local organizations all across Ohio. And then recently, we made a new and exciting investment for BP, and I think it's exciting for BP, I think it's exciting for Ohio. Because who would have thought 20 years ago or even just five years ago, that we would be reiterating the exploration and production business in Ohio. We're taking a position, a big position in the Utica and Point Pleasant shale formations to the south and east of Cleveland. We're here because Ohio is a great place to hire people. It's a great place to market our products and a great place to develop new energy sources. Indeed, one of the big breakthroughs of the original Standard Oil Company was to develop something called low-sulfur kerosene in Lima. And for a time, that made Ohio's fields the nation's leading source of kerosene. And that breakthrough helped light up the night across America and the world. It also helped shape the great global energy market on which our way of life depends today. So Ohio has played an important part in creating the energy sector we know today, and BP believes that Ohio will remain a significant contributor to the future energy world. So what are the few key features of that future, and what part will the U.S. and Ohio play in it? And that's what I would like to talk with you about this morning. The most significant feature of that landscape is simply the growth in energy demand driven especially by the developing world. 
On the basis of our analysis at BP, we estimate that by 2030, the world will likely require 40% more energy than it does today. And to put that in perspective, that is the equivalent of adding another China and another United States to current world demand. That's only 18 years away. I think this is going to be one of the greatest challenges of mankind, to be able to supply that energy, and all forms of energy will be required. And against that background, I think there are three things I think we can all agree on. And first, we want the world to have enough energy to grow and develop. Second, we want that energy to come from sources we can rely on and afford. And finally, we want it to be produced and consumed in a way that is safe and compatible with the health of the environment. In other words, we want what I like to call the three S's, energy that is sufficient, secure, and sustainable. So a few thoughts on how that can be achieved. Sufficiency depends on having enough energy resources available, and there have to be sufficient incentives to invest the billion dollars over time to produce, process, and provide them to customers. It's like any business. And our analysis of the data suggests there are certainly enough resources in the world to meet demand. At today's consumption rates, the world has enough proven reserves of oil and gas to last more than half a century. And we will find more. And I believe, of course, there are limitless renewable resources that will develop over time. The challenge lies more above the ground than it does beneath it. And they are more about the ability of supply to meet and demand at an affordable price. And that depends on two things, markets and infrastructure. We need open markets to channel supplies to where they're needed. And we need the infrastructure, such as pipelines and the entire supply chain of businesses, to make sure those sufficient supplies are available when people need them. And I think the lesson of history, and especially recent history, is that where competition flourishes, suppliers build infrastructure. They also develop the technology and pursue innovation to gain a competitive edge. There is a chain reaction from competition to innovation and investment, and then to increase supply and affordability. We see that repeated around the world. There is no better example of this in action than the U.S. shale revolution. I think it is one of the most important developments in the energy industry globally for many decades. It has already changed the world. It has changed geopolitics in the world. And it is no accident that this has happened in one of the most competitive business environments in the world. I'll come back to that in a minute. Similar principles apply in the areas of energy security. Competition leads to a diversity of supply, and diversity provides security through opening up multiple sources of energy. There are some <clears throat> who cling to the concept of energy independence, which was much debated in the 1970s. But I think we've learned since then that true energy security doesn't come from barricading yourself off from the rest of the world and hoping you find oil and gas. In fact, I think that's a prescription for insecurity. Can you imagine the problems Japan would have had last year <clears throat> if she had been in a state of so-called energy independence when the Fukushima disaster occurred? As it was, Japan has a very long history of importing liquefied natural gas and coal and was able to dial up the volume of the imports when it needed. It was Winston Churchill, the man who converted the British Royal Navy from coal-fired ships to oil-fired ships, who made a definitive observation on the issue. He was heavily criticized at the time for substituting domestic British coal for overseas oil. But he responded that his country should be dependent, as he put it, on no one quality, on no one process, on no one country, on no one route, and on no one field. He said safety and certainty in oil lie in variety and variety alone. 
I believe these words are still true today, and they apply not only to oil, but energy in general. The best path to energy sufficiency, security, and sustainability is found in a diverse energy portfolio, one consisting of traditional fossil fuels, as well as alternative energy. And that portfolio is best provided through a very dynamic global market that ensures the free flow of resources around the world. In fact, pro-competitive policies support energy security by boosting both domestic production and access to global markets, and they have helped America become less dependent on imports without resorting to protectionism. Now, for three years running, the U.S. has seen the largest increase in oil production outside of the OPEC group. Production has increased by more than 16 percent since 2008. It's astounding. Oil output in 2011 was the highest seen since 1998 in the country. And the Department of Energy tells us that net U.S. imports have fallen by one-third from the 2005 peak of 12.5 million barrels a day to around 8.5 million barrels today. In terms of natural gas, a few years ago, the United States was set to become a net importer of natural gas. Today, the U.S. is the world's largest natural gas producer. Who would have thought? It has estimated to have between 50 and 100 years' worth of domestic supply. And indeed, soon, the U.S. may be exporting liquefied natural gas to other parts of the world. Onshore in the U.S., the game changer has been the development of unconventional oil and gas, such as the Utica Formation here in Ohio and the remarkable Bakken Formation in North Dakota, which has been responsible for that state ramping up and surpassing Alaska in oil production, now ranking second only to Texas. Offshore, we anticipate the deepwater Gulf of Mexico will continue to grow in importance. And for our part, in spite of our problems, BP expects to continue investing at least $4 billion a year in the Gulf of Mexico over the next 10 years, maintaining a position as the Gulf's leading investor and oil and gas producer. But our investment in the Gulf of Mexico is only one part of our commitment to the U.S. Ohio and the Midwest, more broadly, are important players in BP's efforts to ensure energy security and security of supply in the years ahead. Our Toledo refinery has been part of the life of that city for 93 years, since 1919. And since 2008, we've been operating it in partnership with Husky Energy. It produces around 6 million gal gallons of product every day, and it, that is enough gasoline to fuel every car in the Cleveland and Akron area. In the last two years alone, we have invested over half a billion dollars in the Toledo refinery to make it more efficient, cleaner, more competitive, more modern. And our joint venture with Husky will also develop the Sunrise oil field in Alberta, in Canada, which will give the refinery a reliable source of North American crude and ensure the facility's future for years to come. And next door, next door in Indiana, we are approaching the final stages of a multi-billion dollar modernization of our refinery in Whiting in the Northwest, which will process abundant resources from the north of the border as well. It is the largest industrial project in that state's history. Coincidentally, there's an Ohio tie there too, because Whiting was originally constructed in 1889 to process crude from Lima. Still further west along Interstate 90 is Chicago, which is the historic home of Amoco, as Shelley and, and Joe mentioned. It's another of the heritage companies of BP, the one that I joined many, many years ago. The Chicago area hosts about 3,500 employees who support many, many key businesses. These include our U.S. refining and fuels research centers, which we develop cleaner burning fuels, and most visibly, heads up all of our East of Rockies fuels value chain which manages sales and marketing activities through 9,500 BP branded stations stretching from Minnesota to Florida. But it isn't all refining and marketing. As I said earlier, we're also returning to exploration in the region right here in Ohio. Nearly four months ago, we announced an agreement to lease about 84,000 acres in Trumbull County 
for future oil and gas production, fingers crossed, in the Utica and Point Pleasant shale formations. We are in the very early stages of evaluating the prospects, but the Ohio Department of Natural Resources estimates recoverable shale potential as much as 5.5 billion barrels of oil and 16 trillion cubic meters feet of natural gas. This is good news for Ohio if it can be unlocked. And we have a project team on the ground here in Ohio that is advancing a plan to safely appraise the resource, and then we will set up our offices in Warren. In the coming months, we expect to acquire seismic surveys, prepare a development plan, and survey land for initial wells to be drilled later next year. And we'll be doing this in accordance with environmental best practices and keeping the communities informed all the way through. It is critical that people living near oil and gas operations, as well as the public at large, have as much information as possible about our activities and that they can satisfy themselves that we are working safely. For example, in each well we drill in the United States, we use multiple layers of protection, including steel piping encased in cement. We also support state-level regulation, including Ohio's recent decision to enhance its regulatory structure. And our plan is to operate at the highest standards based on the best available science. And I would hope that everyone in the industry would think and approach it the same way. We will bring to this pro uh, project decades of experience in developing America's natural gas resources. Our North American Gas Unit already operates across a vast area of the U.S., stretching from the onshore U.S. Gulf Coast region through the Rocky Mountains and has a presence in seven of the leading U.S. gas basins. The benefits of success will extend far beyond the payroll to landowners, contractors, vendors, businesses, and the public via taxes and public services. Our intention is to be a good neighbor, to support the community, and to hire locally whenever possible. New sources of domestically produced oil and gas represent good news for the energy efficiency and security of Ohio and indeed the U.S. But the wider use of natural gas, along with the investments in refinery modernization and alternatives, will also help with that third S of sustainability. Natural gas is the cleanest burning fossil fuel. It is also highly versatile, useful in power generation, and steel mills, as well as the manufacturing industries and chemical industries that are so important to Ohio's economy. Our concern for environmental sustainability also drives our commitment to the development of alternative energy. I am proud of our alternative energy portfolio, in which we've invested more than $7 billion since 2005. Four billion of that has been spent here in the U.S., and we are focusing on wind power and advanced biofuels. We have 13 wind farms operating in the U.S. with more than 1,000 turbines spinning with nearly 2,000 megawatts of capacity. That's enough to light the cities of Cleveland and Columbus. And while we don't have any cited in Ohio, we believe there is potential here, and we are actively exploring the possibilities. In terms of biofuels, we're involved in developing something called advanced cellulosic fuels in the U.S. that don't use food crops but do deliver big reductions in greenhouse gases. And our intention is to make these fuels at scale and enable them to become a really important homegrown source of transportation fuel in America. Now, along with the three S's, sufficiency, security and sustainability, there is, of course, a fourth S that is key to the future, and that is safety. Everyone here, of course, is aware of the events of 2012, 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico, and all that we've been doing since then to help restore the Gulf Coast economies and the environment. Less well known, perhaps, is what we have done in the company by way of response to this. One of the first actions I took as chief executive was to establish a new organization called Safety and Operational Risk. It reports directly to me. This new organization includes hundreds of experts, many recruited from other high-risk industries, such as airlines, nuclear power, uh, the U.S. Nuclear Navy. 
It's deployed all the way across our businesses globally. They guide, advise, and intervene if necessary. In fact, the head of the U.S. Nuclear Navy, Admiral Skip Bowman, has joined our board. And he has a great expression. He said, you get what you inspect, not what you expect. And so he's put that in place all across the company. We've shut down platforms and operations to ensure we're operating at the highest possible standards now around the world. And we have rejected rigs from contractors that fail to meet these all over the world. And in the Gulf of Mexico and elsewhere, we put in place voluntary performance standards that go way beyond existing regulatory requirements. In short, we intend to help change our industry. We know full well that our success depends on safety, and there's no question safety is simply good business. In fact, safety is the first of our three strategic priorities, along with building trust and growing value. And nowhere do those priorities come together more forcefully than right here in the United States. That's because the U.S., even with all the challenges of doing business here, and there are challenges, does remain the biggest and freest economy in the world. It is blessed with enormous untapped energy resources. And for those reasons, we didn't abandon the U.S. market in 2010, even though some analysts and shareholders assumed we would and would have no choice. That would have meant walking away from employees, retirees, shareholders, customers, millions of Americans in one way or another who count on us. The U.S. is important to BP. I also think BP is important to the U.S., but rather than stand here and explain why, I would rather show you something as a little interlude. So if you indulge me, I'd like to do something a little bit unusual and show you a short animation of what BP's role is in the U.S. Now, thank you for indulging me in that little commercial, but every time I see it, I'm more and more proud of the people I work with in this country. And it reminds me that the investments we're talking about will require the service of many, many more smart, skilled, talented people in the future, highly motivated people. Oil and gas jobs have been a notable bright spot in the national economy, and the Wall Street Journal 
showed recently that the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they found that the number of U.S. oil and gas jobs has increased some 80% since 2003 to a total of 440,000 new jobs. In fact, oil and gas accounts for what I think is a remarkable one in five net private sector jobs created during that period. And there's more potential. Clearly, encouraging the U.S. energy resources is good for the economy of this state and the nation as a whole. And while U.S. energy security is ultimately best guaranteed by the global markets, BP projects that domestic energy development, along with increasing efficiency in the use of energy, will result in the U.S. supplying over 90 percent of its own energy needs by 2030, and North America as a whole will be energy self-sufficient. You can just imagine the geopolitical significance of that. So as you can see, I think the future is bright, and we are bullish on America and Ohio. The combination of the abundant natural resources here, the free market policies, technological innovation that will go on, and a highly skilled and dedicated workforce are what make Ohio and this country attractive to companies like ours. In closing, I would like to thank the people of Ohio who have worked with us and supported us over decades, actually more than a century. From all that I've seen on this visit, the spirit that helped build and nurture the early energy industry and the Standard Oil Company of Ohio remains alive and well. I'm confident that our industry, with Ohio's help, can not only support the economy with jobs, but help lead our economy and our society towards a future where energy is indeed sufficient, secure, and sustainable, and affordable.